Welcome to the new episode of All That Jazz. I'm your host, Matyash, and I have with me Fabus. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. And uh, Fabus, uh, full disclosure, we worked uh, together in the uh, uh, life coaching capacity, and he's helped me quite a bit uh, during the summer when I was struggling to study and all that. So big credit to you to get me in the second year <laughs> of university. <laughs> I love credit to you too for doing all the work <laughs> and showing up. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, coaching is an interesting business. So um, I find that people have all these different approaches and also they, they, the way they find their way to coaching is interesting. So what's your, uh, what's your story and what, what was uh, interesting to you about coaching? Coaching, like you say, I think it has different definitions, the same with therapy, like different people attribute different definitions to how and what we mean by it. And because it's more of a, it's not like a regulated profession, like a doctor that is a doctor. And that's like the specific things that doctors will do. We have different approaches, but even with like doctors, you see different approaches to things. But so that's, that's the generic view of like coaching. Well, for me, how I got to coaching is through being coached so it's just like it was something that was been on my radar and then i got the experience of being coached and i really enjoyed the fact that i was being coached and all the things that i had to go through and how it helped me to grow so mm -hmm. it was like the experience of it that's how most things that i've got myself into it's been like oh this is a fun experience let me see how how that works and then i get interested and then i try to kind of understand it more yeah it's like uh, I think personal experience is the best. Is that that's the first time when I tried coaching was a lady that said, uh, "Oh, I had uh, social anxiety and I did coaching and uh, uh, it helped me a lot." So uh, that's how I first started on that journey. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, let's. Uh, uh, was there something in your life? Uh, going back you know early history that there was because for me as some of you know it's procrastination uh, all my life and uh but what's, what's been for you the the thing that that was like that that was the biggest hurdle in your life it was uh back in all the three or four when i had to kind of like uh I went into university in the States, but I wasn't really performing <laughs> at all. And the harder that I tried after like falling back, I would, like the harder that I tried, actually the worst that I did even like, it was emotionally was like a bad place for me to be. And it was a necessary step for me to grow. Yeah. But at the time going through it, I was like, this is hurting a lot. And then I had friends that helped me out. And that was around the, the time that I thought actually, yeah, it's really good to get help. And I'm, really like to do what other people did for me like to help people and support people when they need it and kind of like during our hard times we actually get together with whatever is kind of misaligned and it shows up and everything shows up and then it's just about us I feel like sorting those things out and when we're going through it ourselves it becomes a bit hard because we are part of the problem we're also part of the solution Right. But then through it, it's hard to see a lot of the things that they're kind of getting in the way. But when you have other people uh, that help you reflect, or when we spend time to reflect with ourselves, then we can get a bit more clarity and actually say, oh, okay, so these are some ideas that I need to let go of. These are some new things that I need to do. Yeah. I, f I find the idea of like, like oftentimes I'll be sometimes annoyed at other people and all that, wanting them, them to be different. But then, you know, when I look at myself, it's it's hard for me to to be different and hard to for me to to change. So it's like, uh, ah, man, like the the idea of changing oneself is even so hard. Like uh, just the simple habits, you know, so like. So how, how, what kind of tools did you find that, that were like really helpful to you? First of all, I, I really like this idea about change because 
there are a lot of times that we feel stuck and we're like, there's nothing changing. Like everything remains. I've been you know, procrastinating for all these years. Like this hasn't changed. This hasn't changed. I keep yeah. getting the same, the same thing. Which when something keeps repeating itself, it's just something that we need to pay attention to and actually understand what's happening behind it and what's happening. Like why are we going through this and what, what brings that suffering to us? But also noticing that change does happen. So we, we, uh, we believe like change or we don't believe that like change happens or it doesn't happen the reality is that change does happen and we can see that into philosophy we can see that in our day-to-day life things change there might be like periods that might be long other ones are shorter but even like on a minute to minute we know that things change like nature changes everything keeps evolving and moving yeah so like grabbing that idea it really helped me when i was dealing with the stuff i was dealing with and whenever i deal with other things it's just like Oh, okay. So, you know, this tool shall pass. This is the usual right. like, quote that we've heard, but it's, it is because it's true. Things will change. Now, in what direction they'll change is, is maybe not always to what we would like to happen. Yeah. But knowing that change is possible, it opens up the gates of saying, okay, so there's something that I can do or there's something that, that this will change. Right. So that was like one idea. Yeah, that was one idea that actually really helped me because that that gave me hope. That gave me, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel saying, actually, I will get out of this, you know, and referring to my stories is like, oh, yeah, it was really dark back then. But it's just like I will get to the other side and things will be better. So that gives you that opportunity to cultivate that faith and hope in yourself and that you will manage to get through whatever you're going through yeah it's like uh but it's also i think this idea when you go especially when you're going through a hard time what you uh, look at like if you're just looking at the obstacles and everything you don't have and all all, on the one side and then if you look at what you do have which which might be small (laughs) but actually it's if you look at it it's quite big so i find this uh this kind of duality of what you focus on really um something that's quite important like the attitude mm-hmm. i guess what you focus mm-hmm. on right yeah attitude attention the way you approach things so like that's the other thing like perspective which angle are you looking at something yeah because the different angles to everything and that's why like we can both watch a movie we'll have a different view about it we might both like it or we can be i like it you just like it but it's like perspective happens so it's like from which side am i looking at this and then what you're saying appreciating the things that we have no matter how small, actually, the minute gratitude has been a big thing. Like, the more that we appreciate the things that we have, the more things we can learn to see that actually we're missing out on. And that comes with presence and appreciation and us being more intentional in the way we look at things. Mm. What, what, what do you think about resentments? That's a, that's a strong emotion. That's like, uh, uh, like a lot of people, especially when I deal with, uh, you know, political realm and all that, when you're going to debates with people and, but, 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 or family, oh my God, goodness, you, you know, we talked about, you know, some of my personal stuff with family. So it's so hard to deal with family and stuff because the resentments are so huge sometimes and you mm-hmm, expect mm-hmm. people to be a certain way but but they're not and i'm like ah i guess it's always about changing oneself but right but it's hard to to keep that focus right on just yourself it's keeping the balance between things so if i do something that you don't like right you can get really defensive about it and you can tell me off right or you can turn a blind eye and look the other way Mm. But there's a fine balance of when we do what and for what reason we do what we do. So when I was younger, a lot of people were like, yeah, yeah, it's all good, it's okay. But actually, it did bother me. Yeah. There's a difference if I'm attached and it is bothering me. You know, if you did something to me and it's bothering me, then I need to let you know that it's bothering me. Now, why is it that it's bothering me? That's a different subject of study. And it's an important one. But for, right. the, for, the, for, this, for this sake, if it's bothering me and I don't tell you anything, then I start to build resentment. Then I start to build my anger. But you see, the key there is that I'm building that for myself. 
with myself to myself before I actually send that to you because right. I'm being angry. I'm not letting you know. So I'm capping my emotions because I don't want you, you know, to get upset at me or I don't want us to have an argument or whatever that is. Or I might even tell you, but you still keep doing it. So I still keep getting angry and resentful. So uh-huh. whether I tell you or not, then it depends. And the thing is, like, I have this expectation that I want you to behave a certain way. Yeah. So that's a key as well, because you see our ego. Our ego comes in and say, I want you to do this, or I want you to do that. I'm not giving you the liberty to be yourself. Of course, that doesn't mean that I completely let you do whatever you want, especially if it involves me and over crossing my boundaries. That was a hard lesson for me as well. Because like, yeah, okay, so I can accept everyone and be very kind. That doesn't work yeah. for all either. Because someone comes, they throw you onto the wall and you're like, well, I've been kind. Right. <laughs> I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of misunderstanding about... I used to like be really shocked by the, the statement that nice, guy fin- nice guys finish last. But it's not about... It's not the niceness. It's like the... Uh, the people pleasing in a bad way meaning that you like you said like you have uh that somebody has no boundaries and that you, you you let people walk all over you so th- that some people would consider that nice but i don't think it's that nice not not particularly not to yourself right we all see I'm trying to think now. I'm trying to think very carefully because I know, like, I, I, I've, I've been part of that. I can still go into that. It's just like basically the, the idea behind people pleasing and being nice is that I want you to love me, and care for me, and accept me. Yeah. So that's the big, the big picture says that. In general, it's just like, yeah, I want to be accepted. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to make sure that you like me because if you like me, then I will be okay. That's the notion behind. It. That's the narrative, and I'm, yeah. I'm saying the narrative because I've lived that narrative for a long time. <laughs> we don't always register it. We're not always doing it intentionally because that's the way it is. It's just how we show up in life and how we behave. So that's the narrative that goes into people pleasing. But you said something else, and I'm trying to remember. Um. Uh, well, yeah. Th- there's a saying that nice guys finish last. As far as as far as dating that, as far as dating and all that so there, there's that component as well and uh but it's not nice because it's like like you said before boundaries like you're letting people walk boundaries over. are super important and we've learned like we just, through doing our sessions together you saw like kind of lo- a lot of it which took me a long time to understand is actually how do i apply boundaries to myself first because right. once I know how to apply boundaries to myself, then I can apply them to other people. And there are techniques that we can learn to do boundaries with other people through the way that we talk and the kind of things that we say. Or like, keep, you know, there's a famous one, the broken record, which basically you keep saying the same thing, so you're reaffirming yourself. These things are great, and they can help you grow, and they can help you more come in touch with your boundaries. But where do the boundaries start? Boundaries start with us being in touch with ourselves because we're constantly being fed from into our conscious mind, through our subconscious mind. It's, it, it's the gut feeling that we're talking about. So if I might not be able, like if you do X, you look at me a certain way, for example, I might get ticked off. I'm like, what's up with you? What's wrong with you? you know, I might not <laughs> say it, but I'm thinking about it. Oh, this maybe meant that or it was because I didn't pick up my plate at lunchtime. Yeah. We fill in the blanks, but the thing is, like, our subconscious mind will trigger and will say something's off. It might not spell it out. That's the bit mm. that we get confused. Like, it won't be spelled out um, all this um, I just broke up because right. we have to actually go into it. But it's, it's that temperature gauge that we get. Like, I don't have to tell you the pan is hot. Like, when you go near it, you feel it. But if you touch it and it burns you, you realize that your mind will tell you. So next time you walk into a situation, you see something. If something is off from our truth, it doesn't mean it has to do with a generic truth. But if something is off from my truth, then I need to be able to register that. Mm. And then I need to communicate that in order to affirm the boundary and say, actually, this is not okay with me. And that comes also with agreement and acceptance. Like We don't necessarily have to agree with each other and things that we're talking about the acceptance comes in like i can allow you to express your opinion 
and I don't have to make myself right on top of you and say, no, I'm right, you're wrong. Right. It's we often do. And like that, that's again, changing the boundaries. That is, I'm trying to change your boundaries so you express my truth. And that's all ego-based. Yeah, so, trying to change people. That's so common. Um, I mean, there's something happened in my family recently. And well, to some, it's not that others were affected. It was just one person. But then everybody tried to talk to him and uh, tried to talk him out of it uh, because what he was doing was bad for him and all that. I'm not going to go into details, but it just, uh, I was like, and then they asked me to, to talk to him. And I was like, well, I, I'm, I don't, you know, if, if everybody else talked to him, I don't think he's going to make a difference if I, if I talk to him as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know absolutely I, I just i don't know what to do like uh and this is uh i know from my experience like if i'm setting my ways i'm here and other people try to talk me out of it and then another person walks in with the same thing that's not gonna that's not gonna you know convince me like <laughs> unless there's something or a really respected person or there's something like uh, yeah, but not convincing me outright, like by force. That feels like wrong to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you think this is wrong? Uh, it's just, Why is it wrong for you? Uh, maybe because I'm stubborn. That's part of it, too. But I think a lot of people are like stubborn. There's, some, there's something that just, just doesn't, feel, doesn't feel right, you know, when... Uh, yeah, like... Uh, uh, I had a friend that um, uh, last year that wanted me to wanted to tell me that I shouldn't go to university and shouldn't do this and that. And uh, I asked him to stop and he wouldn't stop and stuff like that. So that, that really upset me and I had to like walk away. Uh, and I, but I think there's so much of that in, in life, like people crossing boundaries and not respecting mm -hmm. other people. And that's, that can destroy relationships and it has Absolutely. some some of them Just, yeah. Well, yeah again when you're overstepping the boundaries and those boundaries are being either not being on one side they're not being communicated from the other side they're still being trespassed of course you get resentment of course you get anger of course you get fights of course you get relationships to break yeah so part but, of it is so. yeah well, well, well how can you like when somebody's obviously destroying themselves and you want to change them you want to save them the savior complex the same <laughs> who, how who can gives you do us that? the right who gives us the right to go and save our people i don't know some some greek god gives us i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's coming from I, that I, place i i get it because it's like, it's also part of what, what i do it's just like i want to help you and we you know go make this happen and we can make change but even like when we started our call, I said like a lot of the changes that you made, it's because you made them, not because I did something. Right. It'd be nice for me and coming from the ego, oh yeah, look at me, I did this, I did that. What if, I, for, what if Apollo comes into in a, in a dream and says to you, you know, they need to change this first. <laughs> it goes into trying to control people yeah. and things. And when we're trying to control people and things, we usually come from the place of the ego. So we're starting to lose part of the battle because we're trying to do it for egotistical purposes. So it's like, I'm trying to control you. I'm trying to make sure that you do this because I think that's best for you. And it has the whole good intention. There is a good intention in there. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes it's just about being manipulative. But on this side, like in the story that you were talking about, yeah. you have a good intention. You're trying to help someone else to see something that they're not seeing that you judge is not right for them but you are right. judging what's right for them. And we don't always, we think that we know what's best for other people, but the reality is we don't know what's best for the people. What if they're like an alcoholic or something, we just objectively see that it's, that it's bad okay. and that so we want to fix something... them? <laughs> yeah, so you again, you're trying to control someone, you're trying to change someone to do something differently because you think what they're doing is bad and wrong for them which i can see that you have to factor in addiction in this because addiction can have its own cycles and it can make people behave and things and do things that they want to do but they don't really want to do and they can yeah. see that happen but 
a lot of the people, it's the same thing. If you tell them you need to stop drinking, what are you going to get? You're going to meet with resistance because yeah. they're going to go in defensive mode because someone is trying to control them and tell them what to do. But if, and again, it can affect the quality of other people's lives. So if you have a family setting and the father, for example, is an alcoholic, then it is affecting the, the, the system of the family for sure. Yeah. But what we only grow and change when we have, when we go through the experiences and our internal, what I like to call fermentation. So things might be tough, things might be hard, but it's that fermentation that creates the change. It's that fermentation that creates the good wine. And sometimes people go throughout their entire lives and they don't make that happen. But other times you see that the people who actually go through that and learn through their mistakes are the ones that, that grow more and more stable, but it's their battle. I like, I like something Kate, Kate Byron says. She says that, in, in, this, in this universe, it says the three, three jobs. One is the God's job. Yeah. And then the other one is your job. And then the other one is my job. So she talks about basically locks of control, taking charge of, you know, what we are truly in control of. So if it's raining out there, there's nothing you can do. Once we know that, it's just like, that's, you know, if there's a flood, that's God's job. It has nothing to do with it. I can get upset. I can get angry. I can agree with it. I can disagree with it. It doesn't matter. And then it's your job. And then it's my job. But the things that are your job are your job for your sake, and they're not mine. But I'm trying to make your business my business. And that's right. when things get confusing. But you see, you're already breaking boundaries. You're already trying to control people, control outcomes, control other things, and getting attached more and more. Basically, the more that we try to do that for other people, what can we do from that point, though? All we need to do is look at ourselves. Right. It's going back to earlier. There's something that's, 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 that's off for me. You know, you did something and I respond to that. Okay, I can actually look into that. What is that thing that actually ticking me off? What, what about um, sometimes saying something actually has an effect. So you don't know, like uh, there's an example I know from basketball, Charles Barkley um, likes to eat. And um, back when he was first year on the NBA, he was, he was a professional basketball player, but he was a bit too fat. And uh, Moses Malone told him, he's like a legend uh, in basketball. Moses Malone told him, um, you're, you're lazy, you're too fat, you need to lose weight. And he actually listened to him and he started losing weight. So, so he came to his right weight because he was like, I don't know, like 30 kilos overweight or something. So he was affecting his play. But in that instance, he actually listened. But I think that's really rare that people listen. So, but... But how do you know if that something is, I guess it's very, you can't know until you say it, like if somebody's going to listen to you or not. But maybe it's because Moses Malone was somebody that Charles Barkley respects. So that's why he listened to him, right? Yeah. So if someone is of authority, whatever that is, and you mm. see that from schools to work to this and that, people are more open to listen to something. Yeah. This is the key that we can all get. Can I be more open into what other people say? It doesn't mean that I have to take everything on board, but it does mean that I need to register what other people are saying. And I can register how it makes me feel. I can register if I agree. I can register, you know, it's that sense of I want to be open. Right. Because like you said, I can hear things from all different things and people. Like I find this with kids. If you're open and you're listening to kids, instead of telling them what they need to be doing, you can learn so much from the kids because they, they, they think differently. But right? well, we need to be open. If we close ourselves and say, oh, yeah, I know best. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you. Then we're not progressing. So part of it is us learning to be open and learning to, to, one thing, listen to other people and hear what they have to say. Understand them. That comes with curiosity. Why, you know, why is this person saying that? Is there some truth in that? You know, this person just told me I need to, lose weight of course if they have the authority a lot of times it bypasses all of this because we're like i admire you so much that whatever you say i will do yeah but even that can have a problem you see the problem because um, i could tell I, you anything in the moment he was probably hurt by it the being told that he's lazy and fat which he was <laughs> 
that he was eating too much. Uh, those are all facts. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in the moment, I guess uh, it was a, uh, it's a bit of truth because it's hard to swallow that truth. But um, that's why sometimes things that they heard actually are very truthful. And that's why we need to be open. Because if you tell me you're fat and you're eating too much, and my tendency is to put my shield up and say, no, I'm not willing to listen to that. I'm not willing to listen to what's right in front of me. There's a right. difference between you making fun of me and you telling me my truth, telling, telling me your truth or what you see. And that goes back into your question. The point is not for you to convince me or to force me to, you know, to stop overeating or to eat better food. The whole point with the boundaries and, and, and expressing what's happening within you is you to tell me what you see. Without having that tendency that the ego brings in, that you need to force what you see into me, into controlling me, or into me accepting it fully when you told me. Mm. What you what is your truth might be my truth as well. What is your truth might be completely different and removed from my truth. And that's where it comes into to be willing to communicate, to be willing to express what's happening inside of us. Because a lot of times we have those you know gates and walls. Yeah. And we say, yeah, yeah, okay. For whatever reason, sometimes it can be from fear, from it can be for acceptance, people pleasing, all the things that we're talking about. Then we do have a duty. A lot of times we do have a duty to say what we see. When you see a kid and they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Right. If you if you if you take a stick and start running after them, then maybe you're overdoing it. But to tell them what you see. Right. And as a parent, it must be like really tough. Like when you see your kids like going through situations that are, I mean, as a, as a parent, it's different because you have an obligation as a parent to, duty, absolutely. to as a, yeah, a duty to tell your kids like what's happening and, and how they should act. And if they don't, then, well, there will be consequences. So you, have, so you have to set boundaries in a different way. That's something, though, that we need to realize as humans, that whatever we do, there are consequences. Mm. It doesn't always mean, you know, that the teacher or the parent will come and chase you around and again, that you have to, to gauge as well, because the times that we need to make sure that kids do things, you know, it's just like kids, as kids, we all need to learn. <laughs> to find their boundaries and we all need to learn to listen as well. But it's, it's part of it is like, and that applies in life. Somebody else has a different experience about something, a different perspective. Mm. If I'm open enough, I can hear to that. If I'm not running around all the time, actually sit and listen, it's like, okay, then I can take them on board. The other thing is like, again, with kids, you want to give them the space to make mistakes. Right. This is huge. Everybody, not only kids, like whatever I say for kids applies to adults. It's like it's the same at the workplace. Employees need to make mistakes. If, you do, if they're constantly coming to you to get what they need, we're not empowering them. We're not leading them. We're not creating powerful leaders of tomorrow. We're creating dependent people. Right. And which means they're lacking freedom. We want people to be free. We want them to make mistakes. We want them to do certain things. But there's certain things like what you're saying. If it's breaking the boundaries, if it's breaking the boundaries of values in the family, in the society, then we need to reaffirm those values. Mm. I mean, I remember when I was in uh, electrical school, or trade school, and uh, I used to be so insecure. I would like, um, I didn't really, wasn't that interested in the subject, but I, I remember I was like so asking for approval or if this was okay, like every, like a lot for my uh, teachers. and. Uh, but yeah, that, that's just because that came from like me not not knowing what I was doing, but also like some mm -hmm. kind of um, comfort or consolation or approval from the authority figure because I was so like lacking in size. So I was like, oh, tell me, or oh, is this okay? Or is this okay? Like <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in constant communication like that, you know, from that standpoint, like I, I need... I need some validation or I need this or guide me or this I like, but it was too much. I think sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you yeah. say, with everything, there is a balance. Mm -hmm. Anything, any idea, even the best idea, you take them too much to the edge of you, you will run into trouble for sure. So it's like a bit of validation, a bit of actually checking the facts with other people can help us. But if it's constantly 
upwards, you need to tell me that I'm worthy. You need to tell me that what I've done is right. Then I'm lacking what I need. And what do I need? Like in that situation, what did you need? Yeah. What would you say you needed at that point? Uh, I just... I just needed to feel okay. I was so, um, I, I was so insecure about uh, what I was doing. I wasn't sure, you know, because it was, it's not like, uh, it's not art. That's, you know, uh, when you're doing with dealing with electricity and stuff, that's specific, like either it works or it doesn't or something goes wrong. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I was very, I was very, very afraid of making a mistake or doing something that I'm not supposed to, you know, things like that. that so if uh, you made a mistake, what will happen then? Um, well, then I'd, I'd, you know, I, I'd be, I could be reprimanded or be saying I'm, I'm stupid and this and that. Well, I guess some of that comes from my family, <laughs> but, you know bad experiences like you that. see you have you have the seeds that you're saying comes from the family this and that but in the moment showing up as yourself because no none of them are around you but we still carry certain things so how are you building that insecurity in yourself in that in that moment in that right. scenario i know it's, it's it's a while back but it will give you insight also for today so in that scenario when you were there how were uh, you creating that insecurity uh, how am I creating it just by 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 not being sure of myself and just being it's like a it's almost like a house that's like sliding in the mud and you want to like uh, you want to hook out ropes and you know every which direction hoping something sticks and it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't collapse but it's actually it's foundation it's it's the cause of why it's collapsing it's not like something out there uh so the the foundation needs needs working you know uh so when all that maybe that's a bad analogy but when all that foundation is moving about and, and you're kind of trying to make things stick so what's the one thing that you reach out for from the outside and which you mentioned um trying to get approval and so that does it, what that helps you feel a bit more like i'm yeah i'm grabbing onto something that's like uh i guess everything comes down to love everybody seeking is seeking love it's just that they don't know where to mm -hmm. find it i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh where is the best place to find love now oh, this is a coaching moment right here <laughs> within <laughs> uh, why within though i know from us we we need from the outside as well but primarily within but why uh, at, yeah but i think self-approval is huge like uh you know, uh, I'm reminded of politics, and there's a there's a thing in the U.S. politics they do a lot, and they rely on this is approval rating. You know, but then the most important question is, what is your self approval rating? You know, is it below fifty percent? Then you're in trouble. <laughs> and sometimes for me, it's still it sometimes still goes below fifty percent because I'm like, man. I'm back in university. I'm not doing this and that. And it's like really, um, yeah. Like, especially lately. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go into this a little bit. I'm doing a coaching demonstration. So <laughs> there's, uh, um, yeah. So I'm in university, but but now, because I'm, I'm falling behind on work. And sometimes now in classes, I just, I just skip certain classes because I'm like, ah, oh, man, I'm, I'm not. I didn't do the reading and all that, so I'm kind of afraid to even go. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm in a rough place with that right now. To just to be completely honest, and um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's every time you don't show up, what, what are you creating more of? Oh yeah, that's another one. I'm creating more of the insecurity, more fear. And uh, I believe in a, in a basic like thing that whatever, because this is a pattern I had, like, I remember when I was 20 and I was doing that with some program I was going, I was like, 
sometimes I would wake up and I'd be like, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like it. Or I, or I didn't, I would go to sleep really late. And then, uh, then, and then I'd wake up and I'd be like, nah, I'll sleep more. And I'll just skip this class because I didn't feel like it. And I feel like in, in the past two or three weeks, there's certain pattern. Some of the classes has, mm -hmm. is repeating. I'm like, man, this is, this reminds me of when I was 20, bro. <laughs> so what, what's repeating? What's the pattern you're noticing? Avoidance. Avoiding. What are you avoiding? What do you feel that you're avoiding? Okay. Bad, bad feelings about myself, you know? I don't want to see the low approval rating like, uh, like right in front of me. I want to avoid mm -hmm. that. Uh, I don't want to, but it's still there. This mm -hmm. thing, it's still there. So if I were to put in the room next to you, uh, I don't know, a million dollars, a million pounds, if I were actually to go and put them there, whether you go into that room or not, the million pounds will be there, right? Right. If I were actually to put them there. So things are there. Whether we go into the room or not, it's, it's, it's different. Whether we're willing to deal with that is different. So if I replace now the million dollars with a big scary monster called fear, and it's in the room next door, the fear doesn't go away by the fact that you don't go into that room. Right, because I don't you know. You don't get to experience it right. because we're avoiding it going into the room. And what happens with fear, which is a huge love of mine to get into, because it shows up in my life as well. It shows up in everyone's life. It's just like, you just need to be willing to go into the room and see it. And that big, scary monster starts to usually decrease. There might be a lot of things that we have to go through, but the minute we're willing to go into that room, that monster that we perceived was huge. It's just uh, shrinking. And then you're like, that was it? Really? Right. This is great to know, again, it's the same thing as with change. It's a great principle to be aware of. But fear, when we meet it, it actually decreases. That when we try to go into the room where fear lives, that's the zone of growth. That fear tends to mask our desires and the things that we truly want. These are great really? things. Do you think passion is behind? Because I heard that argument recently that there's... Uh... Uh, that where fear is there's there's your passion or something like that but i don't know if that's always true for a second i'm not talking about jumping off airplanes without parachutes and all this stupid stuff because right? people again yeah. can take it to to the extreme right, for right. psychological things usually things that scare us hide tremendous growth potential and can take us in places that we never thought we could Go. And the only way to find out is by going things that's going forwards and close to the things that scare us and doing things that scare us in order for us to develop, not for the purpose of fighting, but for the purpose of putting ourselves into a new environment that helps us adapt, it helps us to grow. And it's not that the fear will vanish. Sometimes fear vanishes fairly quickly, sometimes it diminishes, sometimes it goes all together, sometimes it takes a long time and then it goes. Sometimes it might feel that way, but actually if you go again into that new situation that was new, you can trigger at least for a bit. So it varies in the way in, in which we experience the fear. But to answer your question, there is tremendous growth behind the things that we're usually afraid of. Mm -hmm. And like to go into that from what you're saying now, if you're trying to avoid certain emotions and a certain discomfort. Yeah. What are those emotions that you're avoiding by not going? uh shame, shame. uh guilt mm -hmm. yeah um yeah those are the two main ones it's like a it's like a self-protection mechanisms mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely because i yeah. i really want to avoid that it's just it seems like a such a grave thing you know like uh I think most people would want to avoid that if they if they see it as a potential that this might happen. It's like, oh man, I I really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really want to avoid that. And uh, so the growth here would be then to if I go, despite feeling bad and all that, I still might learn something and might see that it's not as scary. Or I might still I might still feel bad emotions stuff because I felt. There was certain classes I went to and I wasn't ill-prepared and, and that kind of set the tone for me because I was like, 
I was so lost. And I was like, oh man, maybe it's better if I don't go. <laughs> if I had this happens again. Mm -hmm. So it's based, some of it is based on the experience, like of me being just so like lost and, and like, what am I doing? That this then pre precipitated me to start skipping certain classes if I wasn't like prepared at all. And I'd be like, ah, then I'd be like, well, what's the use? And then throw everything by the wayside because I'm like in a protection, self-protection mode mm -hmm, against mm -hmm. those really low emotions, you know? Mm -hmm. But by throwing it all away, how is that serving you with your goals and your progress? That's part oh, of it's, it's an abyss. <laughs> throw it into an abyss, but the abyss is hungry and it grows. I'm like, no. Exactly, it grows. The more we avoid things, the more those things grow. Yeah, what you well, we what you resist things stays. Also grow, but... Yeah, like what you resist stays basically. Like what yeah, you... what you ask Carl Young, what you resist persists. I really like that. Yeah, like, yeah. You yeah. resist it, and it will grow. And you you're mentioning a few different things. So one is one thing is like avoiding an emotional upheaval or right an emotional reaction. So we try to avoid that because. It's either pleasant or unpleasant. And the pleasant ones we try to avoid, and the pleasant ones, some people are masochists, so they really love the unpleasant ones and they go through. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different story, but it's we're trying to avoid it. Yeah. What are we avoiding though? Uh you will well, it seems uh, it seems pain mostly, but uh, but then but this is a short term. But then the long term, there's uh, there's also long term consequences that we don't mm -hmm. see in the moment. Because mm -hmm. in the moment, I might feel good. Oh, I I skip this class. Um, because I feel so out of it, or I'm not prepared enough. But the long term consequences is I might hear something in the class that might help me as I'm reading the material later on. Um, or and also I'm feeling there's a um, there's a guilt bag that i'm carrying or something like that so when when i'm not doing what i'm supposed to do then there's there's a certain emotional consequence i think to with that mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so every time you skip class you're feeling more guilty and shameful right right Did i get this correctly because you mentioned the idea yeah yeah so and every time you do that what happens to that intensity does it grow or does it diminish if I if I do go to class, if you don't go to class, oh, if I don't, it's it's yeah, it grows. It the uh, the negative, uh, in in the short term, it I might feel good, but in the long term, I don't think it helps me because it creates a bigger version of me going. Mm -hmm. It catches up with you, right? Yeah, yeah. So when the when it does catch up with you, then what are you what are you guilty of? Ah, uh, these these are heavy emotions, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this is the suffering of coaching. You go into the muddy waters. Man. <laughs> yes. uh, you come up I, on the other side, so that's diving for discomfort in order to find growth. Yeah, it's sorry, I forget the question. What, what did you ask me? What's the guilt for? What are you guilty of? Guilty of not doing what I'm supposed to do, pretty much. According to him. To, to myself, mostly. Well, it's also, the, you know, what you're, you're I'm required to do as part of the, uh, the university work and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it's also mm -hmm. that. That's part of it. And part of it is also other people that... Uh, Maybe my family from a thousand miles away that maybe is expecting me to still continue on doing mm -hmm. the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So th th so that's the three elements, I think. Me, the school, the university, I mean, and family. And maybe some of friends as well, too. It's like there's a certain expectation, maybe. Mm -hmm. that... who, is who is agreeing to these expectations? Me, always me. Again, here you want to tread carefully because you can balance it. One thing is like, well, I don't care. You know, you can go into that. I don't have to care. 
So I'll never show up in class, but that's not going to serve you long term for the things that you want. And that's taking the alignment because there are certain rules that can help you. And you can see how negative or unpleasant emotions that can actually be helpful to drive you to go to class. Right. Because then instead of avoiding the discomfort and feeling lost, we're avoiding the discomfort of guilt and shame. Mm. I don't want to feel guilty and shame too, so I'm going to go to class. Yeah. But also let's go back into, I want to get back into that discomfort of when you go to class and you don't understand what's going on or you're feeling a bit like and behind because that's a bigger thing. That's like, like there's something underneath it. Yeah. Before I ask you, I want to tell you this. I had been spending a lot of time reading about this guy, Milton Erickson, great hypnotherapist back in the 70s. I don't know. I just, yeah. just loved his stuff. And one of the main things that he talked about was he said learning happens in a state of confusion. So he used confusion in general as part of change and growth and learning. Yeah. It's learning takes part in a state of confusion. Now, first you hear, you're like, this is, it's confusion. Just <laughs> about it. But basically it's about creating that openness and understanding that basically things don't make sense until they start to make sense. And everything feels alien until it starts to feel known. Yeah, because our brain is starting to connect and create those neural pathways, but that happens in that state of I don't understand. And we feel because we're there, because it's not making sense now. It will never make sense. Mm. But that's far from the truth because this is the process that actually creates understanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If, you, if there's no confusion, then you think you're right, and then there's no, the the cup is already fully full, so there's nothing to to put in it, in it. <laughs> you're not stretching, you're not growing. I'm just telling you what you know. Right. If I'm telling you what you know, then what's the point of you learning? I I already know everything. <laughs> <laughs> But what are you avoiding in that moment? Oh, what, how is this making you feel, first of all, when you go and you feel like you don't know? Um, terrible, terrible, guilty. So you're feeling guilty when you don't understand as well? Um, I, and I'm hiding it as well. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. I might feel, I, I feel like I'm not understanding it, but oftentimes I'll be hiding it or sometimes I'll be like, oh yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't done the work and like, cause they, what they do, especially in group, zoom groups, sometimes they put us in breakout rooms. So the, we go from like 30 to like four people in a group. Mm -hmm. And like, if I don't, if I don't know what I'm doing, like, I'll just like be, I'll just have like, uh, I'll just be like this, I have my camera off and be unmuted. <laughs> and that's, that's mm -hmm. what I do. It's like, <laughs> not even talk you know and uh, this is easy to hide that way online is easier to hide in, uh, mm -hmm, in a way absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> that's, that's i think a lot of students do that actually it's like the modern time way of hiding just mute mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and it's turn easy. off the camera that's it the thing to realize here is like you can hide away from other people but we can never hide from ourselves yeah yes that's been an, an eye-opening for me so i was like oh yeah nobody knows about this but i knew so it'd be like and that counts <laughs> <laughs> i'm good but not really because it's what we say it catches up with you yeah yeah but for that for that specific thing what are you actually truly avoiding uh truly avoiding uh the uh maybe the confirmation that i'm that i'm bad or something like the the reprimand or something like that like that's Japan, intensely what, else, what what other meaning are you giving to that i'm giving it too much meaning i think i'm giving it like this is this is the end all and be all this is this mm -hmm. might destroy me you know this is mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm the criticism that might come from this will be like overwhelming and i'll be like ah oh, i won't be able to recover from this it's like uh, the house will collapse on it on itself you know that kind of thing um, no this is true <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
now that you asked in this way, I, I imagine the answer is no, because even if I was to feel bad in the moment, I can recover and the house is not, the house is not totally wrecked forever. It's mm -hmm. just like, mm -hmm. may have a wrecking ball come into it, but I can rebuild the room or whatever. Like, uh, or if I go out and uh, if I muster up all the courage to ask a girl out and she says no, in the moment that the half of the house will be wrecked, maybe, but, but it, maybe after I rebuild that, it's stronger in a way. So what mm -hmm. you're saying is that, yeah, I get that. So maybe the, the destruction itself is good because you see, you see that the weakness in structures maybe just perceived in your mind and actually it's not that bad. So yeah, yeah. this is a teaching moment right here. <laughs> it's a, it's a, the perception of it is 100%. The perception of it is real. That's what we are avoiding because in our minds, it means this is absolutely the truth and there's nothing to negate that. Mm. How it feels, it's real. How I it feel, it's true. But now that you go into it, it's like, is this really true? Is this absolutely true? Then you start to see the gaps. And also, like you mentioned earlier, you have like the critic, the judgment, the yeah. rules. And yeah. all these things feed into that perception. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the key it would be to then to um uh to go into some of the things that I'm afraid of and, and do them anyway. And, and with that, I, despite in the moment feeling um, maybe even overwhelmed, I can still, mm -hmm. if I can learn to handle it and, and being that one minute or five minutes of extreme discomfort, that then mm -hmm. I find the, the inner strength, you know, to, um, to do it. Hey, Cause actually I feel we're doing this oftentimes and, uh, when I started before, always I feel nervous and all that. So it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's like, a, it's like a courage muscle that you exercise for because what you're always, you, once you start, what happens then? Well, the, then it gets better because I'm like, ah, this is, this is going. I'm not, I'm not stricken by death or not, you know, by guilt or I'm not incapacitated. This is this is okay. I can do this. I can mm -hmm. I can move forward. You know, it just uh, it's just a conversation. So it's not like uh, our, mind, our mind. Our mind will tell us things. Our mind will project things. So going back into the room analogy, we we see ourselves. Like if I were to go into that room, the worst things would happen to me. Yeah, and then somehow by luck or by will or by faith or whatever, you end up in that room, and nothing happens. So you look around and you're like, well, nothing happened. Yeah. Like what like, I was afraid still of. Scared. Yeah. What was I afraid of? Because we have references and we have meaning to how, what will happen, how we will feel and all those things. And of course, one feeds into the other and keeps growing, growing, and growing. And the only way to, again, get into that is what you said. We have to expose ourselves into it deliberately. Mm. And we can't afford to wait for the day that someone will come and take us by the hand and take us to class or ask that girl out because we are the ones who have that emotional resistance inside. We're the ones who need to experience. Our mate next door, he is fine. He goes to class, he asks girls, so, but <laughs> you put him into an airplane and he's like, oh, I can't, I can't go. Oh, yeah. So we all have our own things. Yeah. We all have our own things, but specifically going back into this, so now you're picking it up and you're realizing it. So what do you need to do in order for you to overcome this? Um yeah i it's it's going into it either the uh preferably the the readings because the readings are scarier as well this is one of what i wasn't talking about before but the yeah the uh, there's one fear as well of like doing the work and being like overwhelmed by it as well so there's that part of it mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so the voice is on both fronts is that and then there's actually going to class which is another thing as well but they're both connected and they both work on i think the same principle avoidance like uh, this is scary or i don't know this is seems like a lot of work or uh, i'd prefer doing something else but it's, it's the same it's avoidance like i don't want to go to class i'd prefer watch youtube videos i prefer like oh let's just sleep in longer so i will have to go is, is yeah, that's, that's that's yeah. That's distraction yeah so but i think it's it's so common like 
Well, I have to speak for me. It's common in my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it definitely things like the, the absolutely happen. For, yeah, for many, for many people, and there are a lot of the things as part of the problem because we we are starting to talk more about things, but a lot of things were like, I'm the only one who's going through this. I'm the only one suffering this way. This is only like that's our internal experience. But now things are opening up, like. With yeah, the episode that we're doing now, like someone else will hear this and say, "Oh, I thought I was the only one. I'm not." Okay, so that kind of normalizes, that kind of brings that emotional response back, and to, yeah. to highlight this a bit, I really like a model that comes from is a school of thought, human givens, they call based in the UK, and basically they talk about they've taken things to other research and all these things, but they kind of put it in a nice framework, and I really like to use it. They're saying that the brain is a pattern matching machine. So it's always looking for patterns to match. And then they talk about how we have an emotional, emotional brain. So the lizard brain that is there, and then we have our cognition, the way that we think, and the clarity and reasoning. So there are two different parts of the brain. One is inside and the center. But basically, the thing to, again, know as a concept is like, when we get really emotional, our reasoning cuts off. So when we get, when we see something mm. that scares us, it fires off that emotional brain and that emotional brain, part of the brain, call it what you want, it goes crazy. So it's uh, running around left and right, trying for surviving, avoiding, you know, fight or flight. Right. Or freeze. So these are the reactions. What happens is, what we talked about earlier is, is like, it's our perception. It's the rules that we have in our mind. It's the way we project it. So these things are firing off our emotional brain. Mm. The more times that we go into that room and nothing happens, our emotional brain learns to see and say, actually, you see, nothing happened. So that pattern matching, you know, the person who's afraid of spiders and sees spiders, is the desensitizing. So you no longer are being triggered by that. And the only way, again, to do that is by going into these things deliberately one way. I'll say one way. With other other ways, but basically it's about relaxing more that emotional response. Mm. And there's, there's, a, there's a belief I'd like you to question and a belief to discover. What do you need to, what are you currently believing about you going into that class and feeling uncomfortable about not knowing or not having done the work? What do you believe around that? That it's not good to do that. It's not good to feel those emotions. Mm-hmm. Because you believe to yourself that what you... I should be about. feeling different. I should be... There, there's a, there, there should be competent. There should be, you know, this is... Uh, fill in the blank. If I were to feel this, I would... If I were, if I were to feel competent, or no, if I were to feel like... Uh, you mean from the negative or from the positive? Go from the negative. You're going the right way, but we're skipping. The <laughs> you can go there, but just just to notice if, what's underneath it. If so I were comp- to feel competency, competency comes up, but right. If I were to feel uh, incompetent, let's say, then mm-hmm. then it would be embarrassing. Then it would be all over or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of the narrative. And what's, what's the belief that we need in order for us to be able to show up in the class and actually, even if we get those emotions, that we're still okay. That we're still okay. Um, huge. Well, it's like, uh, even if I, even if I feel this and this, I still am okay with myself and accept myself. Stay there lo- for a moment. Huh? Stay okay. there emotionally for a moment because that's the biggest thing. Even from that, <laughs> we bring it up from emotions to thought. Stay yeah. with us. I felt this or I've done this thing. I can still feel it with myself. Right now. Can I do this right now? Sure. Sure. Uh, you want me to feel the emotion. Mm-hmm. I want you to feel that you're okay, even though you're feeling that emotion. Because uh, that's I... training. Um, yeah, okay. It's, yeah, it seems like a, such an intense thing. 
Um, but yeah, I'm, when when I when it's not as intense, I'm like I can accept this. <laughs> when it comes in you know, the wave or like this intense feeling, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. now let go into it. Allow it to be with your yeah. presence. Don't feed mm -hmm. the emotion. Just be present. Yeah. Because it comes in waves. Where is it before? If it comes and it goes, it means it will go. It will go when, eventually if you go. <laughs> when is it? It's, 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 it's generic, but it can go very quickly. The same way that it comes, it can come very quickly. It can go very quickly. You can come very gradually. It can go very gradually. You can come gradually and go quickly. Right. So I'm putting now in that space of I'm okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, it does feel overwhelming at times, but just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what do you think that builds if you do it over and over and over again? If I do this, if I experience the emotion, mm -hmm. yeah, this is uh, this is good. And it kind of reminds me of uh, of uh, a book called Letting Go by, by Dr. David Hawkins and talks about not resisting the emotion and going into it. And uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was talking about in the book that it's it's actually faster than than the psychotherapy because psychotherapy you have to you have to talk it out but this goes directly to the source which is the emotion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is the thing that we're avoiding and it's, yeah. it's, this is the basis of mindfulness and like being present it's about creating presence in the things that are happening yeah and by creating that presence when we actually do it the theory says that when we become present, things exist for a bit and then they, they melt away. Depending on how big it this, is, I guess. We have to put this to the test <laughs> for ourselves. It's not good enough that I had this and I read this and yeah, this is how it works or completely closed, this doesn't work. Yes. Yeah. We have to try it. Not once, a few times. Because all these things, it's not a one thing. It's like, oh yeah, I did it once, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> a bit more because this is like it's a life skill that can open up doors it still won't mean that we want the world things it still won't mean that we get it right every time but what we are building what i asked you earlier is resilience we're learning to be more resilient mm. and then when we learn to be more resilient then like you said if you not have my house down i'll be back up i don't mind yeah maybe this affected me maybe i felt bad because of this maybe this you know was was tiring me maybe me feel bad about myself by other people but i'm coming back because i know change will happen i know the tides will change mm. like like that actor michael kane and, and and batman begins when he says to bruce wayne why do we fall to to get back up again or something like that <laughs> That's a similar thing. Is huge. Yeah. Um, but when you're becoming resilient, yes. What are you learning about yourself? That I'm capable. That I can. I can. Uh, okay. I can smash the house, but uh, it's 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 a, in a way an illusion because it's it's always going to rebuild anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But and, also that you can. And when you shift this around, so when I go to class next time from the position that I can, from the belief that I can, from the belief that I'm capable, how will you show up in that class? How much more likely you are to show up in that class? Um, uh, <laughs> I spaced out my... The emotion came back. Um, I will be. I will be able to go. I think that that will be, and I'll be able to listen without, without being too overwhelmed or mm -hmm. just being there. I think will be, an improvement over not being there. You know. Mm -hmm. And in a moment of feeling overwhelmed, what can you do? Um, I could just like, sit back and and, and and stop resisting it mm -hmm. and How be there. 
by by accepting it i think i think it's huge like accepting it and um mm -hmm. physically what can you do um i think it's more than physical it's like uh i don't know like physically like we we place so much importance in life but i think it, the the emotional component is huge how to be it is. Open. But it's affecting it's affecting your body how is it affecting your body oh yeah the body is tense the body's like uh, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so what do we need to do instead in order to create that acceptance that openness oh from the body mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. the tactics multiple angles what we're doing yoga we attack this from multiple <laughs> multiple <laughs> angles <laughs> Uh, so with maybe, your body what can you do maybe that's why people do yoga so they like get going to more of that flexibility from the mind from the body and then the mind will become more like that oh that's mm -hmm. a good way um but i think you become more more kind of mellow as you as you let the emotions go or you, you let release the tension because uh, it's all of it is is because I've uh, worked with some healers and there's um, always emotions stuck somewhere in the body, whether it be, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I feel more useful, let's say. Yeah. If I, if I truly it? accept it. When yeah. You do that, where, where's the control? Is it on you or is it on this thing that you're experiencing? um it's just an acceptance i think mm -hmm. so that's but that's like a choice by me yeah yeah definitely a choice by me so going back into your body how can you you said that when you feeling those things there's a restriction there's a way that you close down and tense what can you do instead what's the opposite of that um like I can sit upright and be like, or I can relax in my chair and be like accepting it, accepting the the waves of emotion to come, or or if I'm alone, I can like lay down or whatever, or close my eyes and just kind of like let it come in. Yeah. See, whenever I've done that, is is it's been really successful with, with that kind of meditation is just like the matter of actually doing it more often and, and being aware of it, you know, because mm -hmm. if you don't, then these things uh, <clears throat> tend to accumulate, you know, mm -hmm. so you have more and more of it and you're dragging along this, this bag or, uh, you know, and that, christmas carol movie like yeah, the character that was dragging all the chains mm -hmm. that might be from sins but also it's from the emotions the the suppressed stuff and all that i believe you see that again it's practice it's a matter of practice yeah one thing as a key to give you is also breathing like when we relax our breathing like when we're asleep our breathing tends to be deeper so it's like to relax breathing is key and in mm -hmm. a lot of these esoteric Eastern, Western stuff, wherever you look at, breath is like number one. Hypnosis, we use breathing. It's like it's number one. You want to relax, control your breathing. Control your breathing, you control everything. Because the breathing changes when we're feeling tense, when we're feeling restricted, when we're feeling frightened, everything changes. But when we're communicating into our body, and that's part of it, that's a practice. How can I learn to relax my body? Mm -hmm. That is a practice. And the more that you do it, the better you get. But then with that, you're also creating that space. And you're like, okay, I'm feeling frightened now. Okay. Ooh, not that bad. Ooh, softening up. So it softens up yeah. and then you move on. You don't want to get stuck into that. Like you could sit there all day and try to, to feel the pain. But it's like when it comes, and the more times again that we do it, the better off we are because we're, we're learning to be more sensitive to what's happening within. And I think that's a lot of the things that we're missing out on. And it goes back to our earlier conversation. We're always out there, out there, out there, out there. Mm. But there's so much happening within. 
so much that we miss out on because we're like, bro, oh, I need to check my phone and I need to check this on YouTube. And... <laughs> yeah. And again, I, we're avoiding things. You know? I think um, I think most people that follow sports, they're like very much aware of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick NBA again because it's such a, uh, a lot of people know about it. It's like a certain player's, that have been in in situations before or been in tough games before been in playoffs before and they've they have the experience the seasoning so they're not as they call it afraid of the moment Mm -hmm. and there's other players that haven't been there and sometimes they they choke at the moment you know because they're not or they're feeling overwhelmed at the moment but all it is it seems to me from uh, the conversation we had is that the the players that have been in the moment have have experienced it and see it's not it's not anything irregular it's just a game so and some of the best players that uh, that have hit a lot of the clutch shots were like uh like uh, robert ori from um, los angeles lakers back in the day he was like they asked him like how can you hit these clutch shots you know which uh, the game is on the line and he's like um because i know that if i hit the shot or miss the shot i still will go home and my family will love me and all that <laughs> so that kind of mentality of like yeah whichever way i hit it is either i hit it or not i still have love i still have acceptance you know so from that point of view he was actually more successful because he, the tension because uh, there's a lot that goes into the shot and mm-hmm. uh, and if you're not tense it's a lot easier <laughs> than if you're like stiff and you know you're gonna break the shot so yeah because the shot was just a shot it had nothing to do with who he was and the people around him. whether he put it or missed it himself was not on the line and the, the two things but you see that even great people very successful people people in sports, in politics, and everything, because we are people. We go through these emotions. But you mentioned some things, whether you get hung up on it and choke on it versus you just experiencing it and moving on. And the other thing is what you said, is it's like creating a, a greater sphere of what you will like. If your whole life depends on this one shot or you get shot, then it's a very important shot for sure. But a lot of times it's not what it actually is, but it's how it, how it feels. So that's cultivating a more generic view and perception of ourselves, of who we are and the things that we do and the distance between the two. Yeah. And also in sports, it's, it's, it's a lot about, a lot of people are, especially nowadays and social media, they're concerned about what, what people are going to say after the game and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But if you have if you put more emphasis on the level of the family and you, you tune out the other noise, then yeah, I think you're a lot better off for that because you're not, you're not uh, always like well, during the game, you're not go if you're having struggling, you're not going through the mind and be like, Oh, I wonder what other people are going to say, or this, they're going to say, I'm really playing really bad and all that. You, you don't have that playing in your head. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this question now, because I, I really enjoy how the mind works. And like, I see that as a story that come up from your end, and I've enjoyed that. What is this story that you mentioned telling you? What is it communicating to you that you can learn from? It's a metaphor. Oh, it's the story it? about basketball. It's or... a story about basketball, but what's behind it? How does that relate to university and the things that we've been talking about? Oh, yeah. It's... It's that even if, okay, I get what you're trying to, <laughs> let me see. So even if it's, even if I'm an abject failure in this particular thing in life that's outside me, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm a bad or evil person. It just means that in this particular field that either I didn't try or probably I didn't try, but that's why I didn't do well. So, and it doesn't mean like I'm a bad person or, uh, you know, I'm reprehensible. It just means that this area, I didn't do well. And that's all it means and nothing more. Because before it meant what? Um, 
everything based on self-acceptance or if other people accept me or if I accept me or if I reprimand yeah. myself. Yeah. So now with this new perspective, how do you view yourself and the things that you do? Um, yeah, so it's not, it's, yeah, it's not a big, it's not, not as a big pressure because um, either way I go, if I, if I finish or don't, it's, I, I still have the acceptance I can still uh, love and accept myself, so it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's one or zero. I, I'm still here and I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the bit that you want to save as an emotional experience now and keep it and anchor it in mm -hmm. yourself. Because things will come again. Things will come from your mind and from the outside and from the inside that will make you trying to convince you otherwise. But that is the one fundamental truth. You still want to look after our inputs and the things that we're doing and the effort we're doing. We still want to do the things that are right for us. Yeah. Because right. again, you can take this, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to sit here and look around. I'm okay, <laughs> I'm okay. Like, nothing will happen, yeah? yeah. And there, is, there might be a space for that or then you, you know, it might be a monk up in the Himalayas and that works. Respect for that. But for the day to day, anchoring that, remembering that, and then moving into things that we can progress. And also, the more we put ourselves into situations, the more socially and, and emotionally we grow. Mm. You know, if I lock myself in this room and I never see anyone, my social interaction skills will be very low. But if I'm out there and talking to other people over time, my social interaction will be higher. My emotional intelligence will grow. Yeah. My ability to manage your, you know, you're letting me letting me down or overcoming my boundaries. I become stronger at that because I've had that interaction. If I never affirm my boundaries, then I can never learn to affirm my boundaries. Right. Going back to, to, to the discussion earlier. And also it's a, a momentum as well. You you get to practice it. It's like it's like playoffs. I've been I've been here before, so I know I can deal with the moment, whether or if you are a person that does it the first time, obviously it, it might be, you know, it might be feel overwhelming, but you know, mm -hmm. it's it's still okay. Um, cool. Oh uh, wow. Um, I'm just looking at time. Let's see. Uh, before before we part, I just wanted to uh, um, ask a little bit about. Um, so, I I know you have some metaphysical beliefs, like if, well, if you're if you have a resentment against somebody, do you think that kind of affects them in a way? I know in, in, in Greek culture, there's a thing called the evil eye that <laughs> I find evil infinitely fascinating. But I do think there is something, there is something to that, especially people that are sensitive because... There's a truth and there's a belief and they both work together. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> because like, whenever I'm in Greece, evil eye will be part of my radar quite high i won't always be with it but I'll be like this will be with people like whenever i'm here in england because that belief kind of doesn't really exist it doesn't cross my mind unless some things are really happening and i'm like yeah this is definitely it <laughs> <laughs> but part of it is belief again it's like it's a stance in life it doesn't mean it can be absolute and like other people might disagree i'm okay with that <laughs> so one thing is like do you believe in it the other thing though i Feel there's a truth in it and there's uh there's a famous thing that they do basically you hold someone's arms i think and one person pushes down and the other one pushes up basically the person who's moving the arms you ask them to think of something positive and see how quickly they respond or oh, think something. yeah yeah so you know that and then you think yeah. of something bad it really drops your arms so yeah but again if you believe in these things it will open you up but also we have it's like, if I'm really angry at you and you come in the room, you'll pick it up. I could say that it's, well, actually, you pick up my facial expressions the way, like, my subconscious, all these things. So, it's like, that is there, but if you're in the next room and you're feeling uneasy, if we, it's a group of us and we're talking about you, you come in, you pick up the energy. Mm. Now, whether you want to believe in that or not, I don't know. It's up to you. But the way that I see it is like you walk into a room, someone's been talking badly about you. There's a certain atmosphere in there and you pick it up. Yeah. I think people talk more and more about it and, and it's more uh, 
common now in the uh, in the languaging. They're like, I don't mm -hmm. like his vibe, or I I, mm -hmm, I came mm -hmm. into the room and I didn't like the vibe, or something felt off. And I think people talk like that more often now than they did like ten years ago, even mm -hmm, five years mm -hmm, ago. Mm -hmm. It's so yeah. The the I think uh, there's something to that. And um, talking about evil eye, I did a, I did the course again with a friend of mine. We did we watched. Uh, how to protect yourself if you're an empath and literally he talked about muscle testing and uh and uh he tried like he had a um like he demonstrated like he had a person stand next to another person and they were like oh he's like oh think badly about her mm -hmm. and then her, her arm went weak when she pressed on it and, and then and then he he's like oh think good thoughts about her think loving thoughts and think encouraging thoughts and then she went strong so like uh it's so crazy that you're able to affect people like that as well mm -hmm. and then, then he was like there's uh if you're driving on the road and cut somebody off and if you feel off chances are the other person that's angry maybe if you're sensitive to that you feel it and that that sounds to me like awful like like evil mm -hmm. eye man <laughs> in a way I, like I, it's anger works a similar way like yeah. if i get angry at you then you get angry at me it's like it's the transfers of energy i that's, that's how i perceive it. part of it is like part of it is going back into how perceptive we are into understanding ourselves whether it's like god field or you know energies around us or ourselves and we don't have to go into Wuhan, but it's like how do i experience the world if I'm feeling things coming my way, if I'm feeling the anger, you can feel that coming as a rush, as a wave towards you. Mm -hmm. If we're having an argument, I will push that all to you oh, yeah. and you will get that. And if it sweeps you up, you respond with the same way. And then you have two people who are equally charged having an argument. <laughs> it's like a solar plexus, like clash, boom. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to chakras and uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, you i love these things i really like to get myself involved into these things but at the same time like when i distill things it's like this is affecting my reality this is affecting the way that i perceive the world i know that something happens is it true or not it's true for me that's the, like a big key i like to live with like is it true for you and it goes to the boundaries as well mm. it might not necessarily be the generic truth but is it true for me yeah so, uh, Pebus, if people want to contact you, or where can they reach you? From uh, InsideTreasures.com, my website, at InsideTreasures, Insta, Instagram. I also have a podcast, Inside Treasures, and you can find it on like, Spotify, cool. iTunes, and the best. Cool. Well, thank you for being on. I really enjoyed it, and it felt... Uh, yeah, we did like uh we did a good session as well. <laughs> <laughs> Partly, yeah. Partly. It was good fun. Uh yeah, so uh, you basically it's um it's uh, life coaching that you do mostly. Like if people want to uh, have contact you for your services. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you Phoebus for being on. I really really enjoyed it. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you everyone for listening or watching the podcast.